you. Um, you're obviously in the look back and laugh youth and auto bio uh, panel that we put together. Does anyone know what um, band the look back and laugh is from? Where I pulled the title? <laughs> Nate Mahaston. <laughs> Knew you would. Oh, it's minor threat. Yep. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> it's a minor threat. <laughs> Well done. Thank well you. Done. <laughs> um, housekeeping, just a little bit. Um, please exit through the door to your left. So when we bring in the new people, we have a nice continuous flow. Um, if time allows, at the end of the panel, there will be a Q&A. And because we're recording for our YouTube channel, it would really help our video sound person if you could use the microphones on either side. Um, you can. Uh, step up behind them as we have time for q and I'll leave that up to your moderator. Um, she'll be in charge. And cell phones, turn them to quiet. <laughs> um, and that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Heidi. Get out of the way. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Heidi McDonald. Uh, I'm not Johanna Draper Carlson, who was listed as the moderator, but she couldn't make it here because of uh, the hurricane uh, where she was flying into. So I am subbing for her. Uh, but I'm uh, incredibly pleased and honored to be subbing on such an amazing panel of amazing cartoonists and um, talking about uh, their, their autobiographical comics of, of teen years, the agony, and maybe moments of ecstasy. I don't know how much, well, I don't know what the agony and ecstasy um, ratio is. We'll, far, we'll find out. So I'm just going to turn this over and let everybody kind of introduce themselves and talk about, um, talk about the work that uh, is maybe most personal for them or that uh, they think is most germane. So um, we have a nice little slideshow. So let's see. All right, Kat. Kat Fajardo, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, Ignat's <laughs> nominee. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, well, I'm Kat Fajardo. I am a New York-based uh, cartoonist and illustrator um, and editor as well. Um, and I do a bunch of uh, work about self-acceptance and Latinx culture. Um, and those two are my uh, mini comics. Uh, Gringa is basically about my experiences dealing with um, like racism, assimilation, uh, all the fun bits of being a first generation Latina. Um, and Bandiva is a collection of short stories about um, certain things uh, from my culture, like superstitions, um, you know. Uh, Latino remedies uh, and yeah it's just like a fun little thing for for people to like learn but um yeah that's awesome. it <laughs> um let's see uh Carta mm -hmm. Carta Monier hi everyone yes. <laughs> I'm Carta Monier um I'm a cartoonist from Ann Arbor Michigan um, I would say that most of my work is um, at least semi-autobiographical and focuses like on a range of time, like um, from childhood through teen years through young adulthood to where I am now, young, virile adulthood. Um, and uh, I would say like the images that we have up here are from Secure Connect and then also from um, one of the Game Boy zines that I did um, using Game Boy Camera to talk about experiences of, let's see what, which one this is, um, experiences of like compulsion and trauma and things like that. Um, as far as like work that deals explicitly and directly with teenage years, um, one of my favorite comics that I did is um, a Tijuana Bible called It's a Young Boy's Fantasy um, uh, about a fantasy I had when I was like maybe 11, 12 or something about being kidnapped by the sex queen of Chicago. Um, <laughs> sort of as a way, you know, like, because then no one can blame me, right? Because like the sex queen of Chicago kidnapped me and like and I had no control over it. Um, but like a lot of the work is like that, like examining these sort of like difficult or interesting um, experiences from earlier in life. 
Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nate Powell. Like Here. National Book Award winning. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Nate. I'm from Arkansas. Uh, I live in southern Indiana. Uh, I guess there are a couple of different stages in which what I would do is relevant to this panel. Uh, maybe the first 15 years of cartooning was more along kind of a, I guess, a half fiction way of processing my own life. I think as many uh, folks in their teens and 20s try to process things and try to make fiction, but you know we're still coming out of our shells. So a lot of my self-published stuff revolves around you know, real world relationships involving like love, ghosts, and kind of finding a way to process your emerging voice and emerging sort of sense of empowerment. And a lot of that's inherently tied into coming of age through punk and through a do-it-yourself community and ultimately the ways that ties into comics as well. Uh, Any Empire, which came out seven years ago, uh, is also half fiction that revolves around the relationship between violence and imagination, but also being a G.I. Joe kid in a military family in the Reagan era and developing a consciousness of how to ask questions about and be aware of contradictions and how to carry that into adulthood and do something with it. Uh, parallel to that, I think it's, a, it's important to kind of mention a lot of March as being the intersection of youth and autobiography and being able to lend a voice to John Lewis and his peers as, I mean, let's not forget as teenagers and people in their early 20s uh, being a powerful, viable force to shape the fabric of our country. Uh, I think youth and autobiography falls squarely in March's realm too. And then sort of processing a lot of this, but coming on the other side of youth, my newest book, Come Again, is pure fiction. Uh, and it's like a horror mystery story that processes a lot of also my life now as a parent uh, and watching my growing awareness of like the limitations of like darkness, protection, and then like the dynamics between openness and privacy and secrecy. But watching, it's not directly uh, commenting on my kids' lives growing up as their worldview expands, but as I was making the fiction, it was really weird watching my kids' world and experiences echo what was happening in here as part of the universal experiences of being a tiny human becoming aware of darkness, danger, risk. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and Dash, I, I, I was talking to Dash before and I said, I, I have known Dash the longest and probably, he wasn't a teen when I met him, but <laughs> you were probably... I might have been. I think I went to my first SPX when I was six. 17. Yeah, you were an early achiever. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you've been doing stuff for quite a while. That's awesome. been, di this one's distorted to be, look like a different ratio. But, uh, yeah. Um, Scandal! This, this one, uh, um, the one on the left I did, uh, that's kind of about um, teaching English overseas. And it's been, and I taught English from my junior year of high school, leaving Richmond, Virginia, um, south of Nagoya, Japan, to try to just, I wanted to just leave Richmond, and it was through a program called YFU, and so they would put you in the middle of nowhere um, to speak English to, um, to kids who wanted an English a native speaker um, that was their age. Um, so that this book is kind of like a warped version of that story, that kind of highlight, um, that, um, makes it more about the, I don't know, kind of made it more about the kid's experience of of this practice and the unusual, very strange things that happened to me that I made stranger in the book. Um, and then the other one is kind of a, um, it's kind of, it started off as a parody of an auto, of autobio comics um, because when I was a teenager in the 90s, so many of the alternative comics were autobio. Um, and they were kind of like mundane story autobio comics, and I really liked them. But also as a teenager, I really liked kind of the boys' adventure sort of superhero comic type stories, or like the manga kind of um, genre mat material. So I did a short story that the joke was I kind of combined those two, where it was clearly uh, the, the main character's warped perspective of things. Um, 
and I did that as a comic and as a cartoon. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me speak uh, after Nate. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, actually, you were saying also that you you guys went to school together, right, Nate and Dash? Well, I, I you went to SVA, right. but I don't think we were in the same. Yeah, we passed like ships in the night. So okay. I graduated in 2000. You started in 01? Yeah. So uh, but I, my I, first I, real Comic Con was Mocha 03, and that's where I met you and got the floppy issues of oh, Lovey's brain yeah. as, as perhaps a teenager or barely. Maybe. I did those, I think, when I was standing. But I, I, before that, though, I thought I saw your band play. Oh, this is Sufi true. Sufi Nun Squad. That's right. <laughs> um, and you were, I mean, were you 19 or something? You were uh, 22? Oh, yeah. We 21? started touring when I was 19, yeah. Yeah. So teen achievers. Um, I want to ask you all, uh, obviously... Um, teen time is tough, you know, and it's tougher for some than for others, all right, but it's, it's never easy. So I'm wondering how your, um, your advance into cartooning, I wonder how much, you know, wanting to draw and wanting to be a cartoonist, I wonder how that affected the narratives that you were doing, you know, and whether they were you know, like drawing was your release or was, you know, a fight of freedom or was it, you know, I, a diary, you know? Was it, was it, was it fictional? Was it non-fictional? Or how, you know, how did those two interact, intersect? Please, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go. Um, I feel like I didn't do a lot of comics when I was a teenager. Like, I almost feel like I'm catching up now. Um, and I know a lot of people draw like great comics when they're teens but like for me comics were almost something I did as homework you know like when I could um but what I would do as a teen is I would keep hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pages of diaries um I would keep a diary on a USB drive and work on it every day um so I still have all of that material you know like thousands and thousands of pages from 2008 2009 um, 2007, whatever. Um, and so a lot of the work that I'm doing now um, is transforming that material into the kind of work that I would have liked to have been doing at that time, but like didn't have the opportunity to do and didn't have the, the time to do. Um, and I would say like getting to do that now does feel like sort of a cathartic release. You know, it's it's like I'm getting to revisit this material in kind of like a safe way looking back as opposed to like that, you know, and like you read your old diaries and it's all like just the dumbest shit, right? Like, I don't care anymore about like how this or that friend betrayed me at lunch or in whatever, but like I did at the time and like yeah. it's fun to be able to go back and look at that in this sort of removed way and almost read it as if it's like a letter from like a younger sibling or someone that you feel tender towards. Dash, you were making comics. Yeah, um, I grew up with comics around the house. My dad read comics, a lot of comics. Um, I always wanted to be a cartoonist since I was very tiny and uh, um, my mother's a play therapist. So mm -hmm. that kind of felt like she encouraged it um, maybe. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, psychotically devoted to it, um, drawing lots and, and doing zines, and I did things for the Richmond Times Dispatch and um, illustrations, and, and it's all horrible, and I, and I wish I could go back and obliterate <laughs> all of it. Um, but, uh, and, and it also, um, I was just so focused on it that everything else I think it was kind of wonderful um, you know I didn't like just as an example I didn't like have like a drink of beer until I was like 24 mm -hmm. or something like I was not going to parties or I was just really just focused on comics mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I guess I'm glad that that's how it worked out and look at you now <laughs> yeah. a nerd yeah, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I 
started, uh, so I was really obsessed with manga and anime, as most people of our generation is, um, but I didn't really get into diary comics until after uh, SVA. Um, so like in SVA, they would assign us uh, assignments every weekend, um, kind of like experiment with different materials, different techniques, uh, how to make this kind of comic and whatnot. And um, after college, I wasn't really happy with the materials I was producing or the stories. Um, I would come, come, I would uh, create and assemble like mini comics for conventions like SPX and and you know local shows. But uh, I wasn't really happy with the material itself. Um, and by that time, I was already doing diary comics, um, but for myself. They weren't published at all. Um, and I was really afraid of that unfiltered. Uh, aspect of just like people can look into my brain and my feelings and stuff I haven't had the courage to you know tell anyone um but then I was like fuck it I'm just gonna like <laughs> I'm just gonna make a mini comic and just you know do whatever just uh take this page out uh of this comic or diary comic and that's what um Basically, that's what Gringo was. Um, just like all these feelings I had of just uh, like cultural, like being Latina in, in America and, and all the shit my family has been going through. And I just want it all in like one little booklet. And I was, I did not care that anyone didn't relate to it or whatever, but it was out there. And I'm kind of glad I did it because now people are reaching out to me and like, yeah, this is, I identify with this story a lot, and please make more. Mm -hmm. um, and from there on, it kind of clicked. I'm just like, I should start making comics like this because it feels more meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and from there on, I've just been doing a lot of mini comics of just autobio stuff. So did all three of you go to SVA? Yeah. Wow, okay. 2013. <laughs> she should have sponsored this <laughs> They have the money. <laughs> what were your teenage comics dreams? Uh, well, I, I started uh, I started drawing comics in 1990 and started self-publishing them in 92. So that would have been the beginning of ninth grade. Uh, it's important. I feel like it becomes more important year after year to stress that like Arkansas pre-internet, there was such it's such a desert of information about like how people make comics, uh, access to like well, I mean having the one comic shop in town. But importantly, like, I really was not aware that non-superhero comics existed until, I mean, maybe, like, not counting, like, Underground Ninja Turtles or whatever. You know, like, it might have been I caught some windows through Cerebus or something. But when I, my first several years of comics were, like, Guns and Boobs dystopian mm -hmm. superhero comics. When I stopped being interested in superheroes, I because of like that, that drought, that desert of, uh, of uh, proof of concept, I was trying to write stories that would either, like an early one as a teenager would be basically like adolescent punk rodents doing normal adolescent things. And then in 12th grade, I collaborated on this uh, thing about like some high school revolutionaries who try to overthrow their school and it goes horribly wrong. Um, but when I look back on these, both of those narratives were basically, you know, like without the powers, they were superhero power struggle narratives. And so it really wasn't until 96, 97 when Alberian's The Long Walk Nowhere, published by Migraine, uh, and Chester Brown's I Never Liked You, like blew open the doors to make me understand uh, how how deep and wide comics were, but especially like Al that Alberian comic, uh, I, I had never seen anything like it. It was a standalone thing where 26-year-old Al is walking down the streets of the town he grew up in and walking past these telephone poles and streets and remembering being an angry 13-year-old watching, you know, just awful scenes of you know, suburban life uh, and reflecting upon it, arriving to no conclusion, and then as the sun comes up, going back in his house as an adult and putting on a pot of coffee, and that's it, cold end. Uh, and then, like, there's a scene at the beginning of I Never Liked You um, involving, I mean, the whole, you know, reflections on actual childhood and the teenage years, but um, the kind of tenderness and vulnerability without going from point A to point Z, where, like, 
boy Chester Brown finds his mom in the house and takes her by the hand and takes her down to the kitchen to the fridge and points out that there's an egg that he dropped on the floor. And she's like, oh, that you thought I'd be mad about that? And she just gives him a hug, and that's the end of the scene. <laughs> and uh, like somebody was like, you need to read this book really earnestly. And I was like, oh, thanks. And they were like, no, you need to read this book. <laughs> so I went home, and, and but I was like, okay. And 10 minutes later, I was bawling on the toilet. And I was like, no! But I mean, to me, that was like, it was as if I had never read a comic before. So. I was making personal zines at that point that were coming straight out of my life and were trying to be earnest and direct. But my comics, uh, you know, like still, it, I, I was developing a, this hybrid of half fiction because I was afraid of being that like unconcealed mm -hmm. with things I was trying to tell about life. Um, but thanks, I really, to those two comics, I was like, wait, don't be afraid. Just combine forces like Voltron and make a new kind of comic that you subjectively have never seen, maybe, that mixes the tone of one's zine writing with these dreamy comics landscapes. Um, so yeah, but as an actual teen in Arkansas, like I, I was not aware that any of this was a right. thing that even existed. I think the, I don't know if it was I Never Liked You, but one of Chester Brown's autobiocomics has like the most devastating two panels in comics where he's like, says, you know, in a caption, like, that was a very rough summer. My mother killed herself. And then the next panel is him, like, talking to his friend. I'm like, whoa! <laughs> and, you know, his work has never actually talked about, about that directly, I don't think. Like, you know, he's done a lot of stuff, but he's never kind of filled in that one panel. Um, you know, I saw that yesterday in the, the trans narratives panel, which is so fantastic, and um, I think it was Maya who talked about like, like her, one of her like moments that she remembered. Remember, she was talking about dressing up in this weird costume, and and how she didn't put it. Or pardon me, I'm using the wrong pronouns. I apologize for that. How Maya didn't put it in the right, in the in the, um, into her uh, into Air Comics. And I'm wondering if you know, but that moment was so powerful for Maya. I'm wondering if you have those moments that you think of about being, you know, that are so seminal to you and that uh, have you dealt with them in your work or have, you know, kind of not done it? <laughs> Avoided it. Um, I think I'm dealing with it in my work largely. Um, I mean, like, I really like focusing on small moments, like, um, because I find it difficult to tell longer stories. Like, I'm working on a big book right now and it's like pulling teeth. Um, but I really like focusing in on like small things. Like um, I did a comic sort of recently about um, flash animated um, like sex games that were popular in sort of the mid 2000s. And like that's pretty minor and specific. You know, it's like something that I remember as like a very weird artistic medium that like I was extremely well versed in for a time and like now doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in exploring like those small embarrassing moments that like require some amount of explanation or whatever because like that tells a reader what sort of a person you are, you know? Like I'm not that interested in making my experience universal. So like I um, what Maya was talking about made a lot of sense to me, but like I personally am not interested in like smoothing over sort of the rough edges in my narratives like I'm happy to go into like some digression about like oh well I did this dumb thing because you know like um, I figure if someone's interested they're interested you know they'll they'll stick around anyone else Kat <laughs> you're looking thoughtful <laughs> What was the question again? Well, I'm, I'm saying, like, you know, we all have those moments that we flash back to, and it's like, you know, that are really personal, you know? Yeah. And and sometimes perceiving those moments in, uh, in a work of fiction, you know, like when you feel that moment as that person felt it is so powerful, you know? Um, but, I mean, have you talked about those, you know, one of those seminal moments in your work, or, you know, how did you approach it? I feel like I have an easier time... Um 
well, recently I have an easier time writing about uh, silly moments or day-to-day -day life stuff. Um, it wasn't until I started doing my 30-day uh, like diary comics that I really got into like personal stuff. Um, only because I recently got back to like therapy sessions, and that kind of revealed a lot of things about myself. And um, I only revealed certain things, uh, like little snippets of it, in my comics. But I'm not fully comfortable yet because I haven't determined it myself. It's it's more like um, the diary comic was like a way for me to kind of um, uh, what's the what's the word like. Uh, grasp or understand yeah yeah like the feelings I was that were like erupting after you know these sessions um stuff like just like sexuality and just like past trauma stuff um but I would I feel like it's it, it would be a great um it, it's like a great way to kind of it's like a diary comics or therapeutic so I feel like I, I should go into that hard stuff and I feel like I will uh find a way into grasping that again but it's really hard. <laughs> it's because it's you're showing your rawness to people, and, and even though it's you don't really see the readers um, personally, but it's just it's there in paper, and you can't take it back. Yeah. So, can I ask a question, Heidi? Yeah, go for it. Um, when you all are making diary comics, do you find yourselves like bumping into things a lot that like you feel the need to hide or change because like something about like the medium as it currently exists is that I feel like a lot of the ground has been tread you know like people have depicted themselves doing like every possible embarrassing thing almost you know right like um it's not you know like there was a point in diary comics where you could be like well I dream myself taking a poop you know like that's <laughs> but like you know like at badge this, of honor. <laughs> right like at this point it's like okay you know that's fine yeah. we've seen it you know like um so are you bumping into things when you're making diary comics that you're like very earnestly afraid of depicting i think uh yeah that that was really that was the thing i was kind of like trying to scribble about i i, I think that with a lot of that we're still i think and i think everybody who is who makes autobiographical or memoir narratives on a spectrum, you're finding the degree to which you still need to conceal mm -hmm. an experience, especially one that's dark, traumatic, formative, uh, so that you can talk about it. But I think, like, what to what degree you fall on that spectrum mm -hmm. is, is a very subjective thing. But uh, like, like what I was thinking about really was something, even something like, um, yeah, like there's there's like a very it's one of the like minor, one of the plot points in any empire uh, that has to do with like these these twins who are like in a, tw a sibling cult basically, and the mystery element is basically someone is mutilating turtles in the neighborhood, and Sarah, one of the protagonists, has like a Nancy Drew mission to get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like there are these moments where like you're as a as an older child, even you know, like minor flirtations with weird things, like you know, like animal cruelty or like mm -hmm. discovering you know discovering things against defenseless creatures and mm -hmm. as you're doing it you're aware that that something is happening that is very wrong mm -hmm. but like the way that especially as like you know like as a southern lad growing up in a hunting and fishing culture where like there is a spectrum of like the way that people interact with animals mm -hmm. and the way that intera people interact with people but like in those moments as a child like you you can it's almost like you see yourself packing that bag and putting the baggage right. up for a way later, and uh, even like, you know, like I've, you know, I've never even verbalized like there being a degree of truth to like a weird like animal cruelty right. plot point, because I'm like I'm still not ready, right. and it's it's like such a mi like it's it's actually like a minor thing, you right? Know, like, I killed a frog once or whatever, right, right, right. But like, uh, uh, so using that as a minor kind of example, like. Yeah, like bit by bit, you yeah. figure out which bags you're ready to unpack and to what degree, and there's not an objective measure of how that works, and that doesn't make it less autobiographical. Right. Or... Like, would you say that you're afraid of it reflecting on you, or is it more afraid of engaging with it? Both. As a okay, I think both. Yeah. Because I feel like as far as the reflecting on you, you know, like again, that ground has been tread so much. You know, people put such horrible things in their yes. autobio comics, right? And I feel like there's almost an understanding from readers that it's like a 
somewhat safe space to talk about these difficult things. You know, like if you're like, I did this bad or embarrassing thing, there's sort of an expectation that someone isn't going to read that comic and then turn around and be like, I know your evil secrets, right? <laughs> um, so like, personally, if I read a comic where someone was like, when I was a kid, I, you know, I killed an animal or something, I would be like, oh, that seems hard, but like, I would be upset on their behalf because I would know that that's difficult as an adult more than I would like, be like, what a monster. Right. Nate sure. Powell, frog right. killer. Right. <laughs> well, it was until you saw he sold like frog's legs at his table. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a different context. Surprise. <laughs> no, yeah, I think, I think it's both though. But part mm -hmm. of that is because like, you know, storytelling involves a contract. Like we're creators, but we're readers too. Mm -hmm. And so like, and comics is a social as well as a creative and mm -hmm. like it's an industry too but like especially in an environment like a comic con there's a social exchange as well so there's a, like a a self-referential or like really like a selfish impulse to mm -hmm. like frame things through yourself like right. if i let this out it's about what comes back to me right instead of yeah be, being a part of something and being far from alone in sharing even some of like the the darkest experiences right. of our lives like that's the point right. none of us are alone in the in in many of those darker uh darker chapters of our lives that that made us right mm -hmm. well i but you know i think one of the most interesting things about you know like there is a grand tradition of autobiographical comics obviously and, um, but you know, Nate and Dash, you do fictionalize a lot of it. You know, you, I mean, have you done, like, Dash, have you done, like, really autobiographical? Like, I was here and I did that? So, I think some, some, I, I, I think some things. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, something for Uncivilized that just came out, like a structures scene, and, and a lot of things come. Um, and I wonder sometimes, well, why can't it just be, you know what is the motivation even to to fictionalize it or change it and i don't know i don't i honestly don't think it comes from um you know not wanting to own own it or like wanting to hide myself or something i actually like um when experiences are super specific and not and not being changed to kind of be more general and i feel like especially um, with books that, um, you know, prose books and comic books, it's such a one-on-one -on -one experience that kind of its function is to be very specifically personal um, as opposed to like movies or plays that are, I think, experienced in communities or like you, like on the news, you'll see like crowds of people, whatever, refugees or something, you don't know who they are. And I feel like literature, the job is like, this is, honing in on a specific person. Um, so changing the character's name to something else or altering it, usually it's just to try to um, actually maybe combine more things that happened to me under an umbrella and all, you know, create, you know, making a, a whatever, a um, mixtape of it into, <laughs> into, um, yeah. I, you know, the, the one question you always have to ask in a panel like this is how does your friends and family react? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get a lot of readership from the old family until I had a book out with a spine, and then all, the, you know, it's like, oh, this, oh, I get, this is a book, right? People might read this. That's we support this. Um, I haven't. Uh, my mom really likes any empire. Uh, my my family's had like sort of like a really like wonderful, you know, like we get along well. We're we're not close in that way they, like and a lot of that may be like my older brother has autism mm -hmm. in a pre-autism awareness era and so it kind of changed the tone in the room growing up mm -hmm. a little but like once march book two came out uh i think it moved us forward as a family a lot like my parents then were able to unpack maybe the last of their baggage as like white mississippi baby boomers um and like that book two rocked them real hard as far as reckoning their their unrecognized levels of complicity mm -hmm. or or 
actual ignorance of things that were happening 20 miles down the road from them. Uh, and it kind of shook both of my parents, but opened up so many doors for us to be able to like speak about decades more worth of stuff that they would always dance around. Um, uh, Come Again is kind of weird now because it's like my first book where I'm like, well, there's uh, just uh, screwing in this book. And uh, it's like, I hope you appreciate the, the, the parts that have to do with like priorities and ideals and parenthood and all this stuff, but I'm just going to give you this book and, uh, you know, well, there you go. Enjoy those gene boners. And uh, so like... Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I, I don't sweat that too much. I, I think I have a, most of my friend group comes from punk and DIY, and we've we have literally raised each other, being like, here's something from inside of me, now on the outside for you. Some of it we experienced together, some of it we didn't. So I think that's part and parcel of my relationship with, with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think about it that much in terms of mm -hmm. dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a first generation uh, kid, so my parents don't understand what I do. Um, they still think I'm doing animations. Uh, <laughs> um, family secrets. Family secrets. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do get a lot of good reception from uh, uh, POC communities and zine communities as well. It's very tight knit. Um, so in that sense, I, I feel blessed uh, to be part of those communities. And um, and it's not even from like you know Latinx folks. It's from people from like other cultures as well. That just like identify with your stories because like you know uh, even in my comic superstitions, uh, I talk about um, superstitions I grew up with in Latino culture. But like also it's because of Catholic influence and colonialism and other people from like you know the Philippines or other cultures. Are like oh, we also have the same like you know, superstitions and stuff that are very similar in our culture, and it's really nice to kind of identify and, and connect with them in that way. Um, but once I get that uh, book bound, uh, <laughs> sorry, then I think it will be official for my parents. <laughs> um, I think my parents have always been, like, super supportive, uh, but also, um, I've, I starting, you know, drawing them early and being like a spacey, delusional kid or something, I always found it really easy to not think about how anyone would read it mm -hmm. and just make it, and even make copies and hand them people to, and just somehow have some block that prevented me from thinking that people read it. Mm -hmm. And I had that for a very long time. Um, and I'm really glad I did. And I'm glad uh, um, that, that, you know, when I started, it the internet was not so much a part of it because I think if I was had started m posting things on Tumblr at 17 and and kind of having like a people actually like immediately respond to it, I don't think I could have handled it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a great grace period of of just making things and um, assuming no one read it or cared. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> sorry, sorry in advance. Um, I could not make the comics I made um, before my mom died. Um, after my mom died, I completely cut off contact with my dad, and that's how I'm able to make the work that I make. Um, it's a pretty specific circumstance, but like um, the experience of like growing up in an abusive household, and then also the experience of being trans is having a complete lack of privacy and like people knowing a lot about you at all times. Um, so I really lean into that. Like, um, if people are going to know things about me and my upbringing and my body, I would rather be in control of that narrative and like really push like the things that I think are important. Um, so I've leaned pretty far into it. Um, I assume that my family hates my comics. Like a lot of the time when I do have contact with someone indirectly, what I hear is like, please don't make comics about this or that. And I have to say like, I can't promise anything, you know, because it's important, like it feels important. Um, and like the big book I'm working on right now is about, um, my mother's um, like battle with cancer and then death and 
my dad's terrible caretaking and, you know, the way that he contributed to her death in many ways. Um, and, like, that's a rough thing, you know, that's the sort of thing that would tear a family apart if it hadn't already happened. Um, but I think, again, it's very valuable because, like, people have, like, a big investment in keeping that kind of story from being told. Like, it's very scary to people. Um, the idea that, like, a story like that would, would come out in sort of a frank way because nobody comes out of it looking great. Um, and that's one reason why I think it's, it's extremely important to lean into it and, like, let go of the idea that I'm going to be making people angry or I'm, you know, like, doing wrong by somebody. Um, because I think, like, there are plenty of people who go through experiences like this or substantially worse. And, like, I'm not doing anyone... Um, like a service by sugarcoating it or um, making it seem like something that it it wasn't. Like I have no interest in pretending that I grew up in like a cool, nice family. You know, like th there's no point. There's no point in doing that. It's powerful. It's a powerful narrative. Um, uh, Johanna had a great question, though. Kind of a little bit more. Trying it the other way. What are some of the most memorable or gratifying reactions that you've had from readers to your work? I can go. Yeah, go <laughs> um, I've had some uh, very, very young um, teenagers uh, like cry in front of me, and that is a remarkable weird feeling like um because as dash was saying like you don't really assume that people are going to read your work necessarily like when you're creating it it's very personal and then when people read it it's very personal so you don't necessarily think that it's connecting with anybody in a substantial way um but like i i'm starting to be like recognized by younger trans people um and you know like i'll walk by someone and it'll <gasps> Your Carta, and like that is a remarkable feeling, you know, to think that, like, because, like, all I'm doing is being publicly sad, you know, like, that's <laughs> like, um, <laughs> but like, that has power, right? Like, that's that's super helpful to people, you know, it's, it's helpful to me. I like people who do that. Um, so, um, it is very gratifying when people talk about the way that that work has moved them or helped them through various sorts of things because like it it lets me know that like I'm doing what I intended to do um, for me for me but the thing that popped into my head which I don't know is relevant but when I I make animations and and um, being in those screening, like I did a, a Seeger Rose video and it played at um, Sundance Festival and so you're in the crowd with it and you feel a real time reaction to this mm -hmm. thing and, it, and with, animate, with movies too when they play film festivals and that's really freaky mm -hmm. and really, not, especially after making books where you might have an interaction with someone after they write you or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. But like a moment to moment kind of the temperature of the room or the energy shooting out of the backs of their heads telling you that they're bored right now or they're, mm -hmm. or they're not bored or they're really engaged or something um, uh, was a mind screw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, yeah, whenever I table at conventions or festivals, um, I get a lot of people come up to me and say that they either bought my mini comics or zines like at another like convention or show, and uh, or they like I don't know lent it to like a friend or something, but it's been passed around and they would show me how like worn out it is, and I'm just like, oh, everyone's like connecting with just this stupid mini comic of based on a diary comic I made and it's 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 great I I, I feel uh, really honored um, that people you know talk about my work um, with their friends and like oh I'm gonna buy this mini comic for my friend because I know they'll like it or they'll identify with it um, so it's it's 
gratified and also feel like not worthy <laughs> but I mean it's 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 great I again it's the whole community thing and it's it's so it's, it's very I feel very like blessed but um yeah just encountering fans at conventions is really nice mm-hmm. and we can talk about um our own experiences with like our culture and stuff and it's mm-hmm. it's really nice well Nate you've <laughs> traveled quite a bit <laughs> I, so I think in terms of this question, uh, b- I guess before people started actually really reading my comics or being able to react, I think I had already set up a certain kind of expectation, mostly from being a part of like underground punk in the 90s in a specific era in which my particular cross-section of music socially and creatively uh, was part it's part of the tradition of like people talking about their songs in between every song, mm-hmm. trying to be very plain and unconcealed about things, and really trying to generate dialogue on the spot, take and ha- deliver something for people to to take home and process and move forward with. Um, but it wasn't, I guess, when "Swallow Me Whole" came out ten years ago at this SPX. Uh, that is a work of fiction, though. Like. Uh, Everything that the that the grandmother character says is directly out of the last few months of my grandmother's life, as mm-hmm. she started to have these very powerful delusions as a result of like her final round of uh, her struggle with cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, but like there were personal connections I had with mental illness, uh, but you know some of that having to do with disabilities and disorders through my brother or through my my former career working with folks with disabilities. I tried to keep those things uh, very separate from the story I was crafting in in Swallow Me Whole. But the joy, I guess, of making a comic is that compared to like coming from a background of people being like, this song is about this, this is what it means to me, I'm going to explain it. Now you won't be able to understand the lyrics because I'm screaming them. It was nice to be like, I made this thing I don't have to do that Mm -hmm. because it is its own explanation Mm -hmm. or not, but like it gives you all the tools you need to be able to process that and take it home. So when Swallow Me Whole came out, I was kind of unprepared Mm -hmm. for the power of comics in that way. The fact that all (laughs) of a sudden people were like, this book showed me that I was not alone in my very like unsettling subjective experiences, mm-hmm. whether it had to do with mental health or whether it had to do with my family's mental health or my cultural or family climate. Um, and I guess on the other side of that, um, to speak for and of working with Congressman Lewis on March, that, that's like a, a whole separate thing, but uh, like, you know, from the outside in, people's very powerful personal responses, but specifically, I guess, between me and John Lewis, um, you know, being being tasked with the job to tell, to bring his experiences uh, to life, you know, through his eyes and in, and, and, and in his words, um, you know, I was a lot of times having to fall back on like, okay, like I'm familiar enough with a lot of the details and I grew up in this area, I just have to trust that I have a job to do, but really not knowing how that was gonna turn out in spots. And so like, when the first 10 pages of March Book One came in, uh, or when I finished them, I sent them off to uh, my collaborators and Andrew sent me a, a text message the next day just to be like, I just wanted you to know, you know, like I've printed them out, the congressman read them and he cried, <laughs> and, and it just, it, I was like, wait, like, I, okay, I brought, I, it, it's really weird to bring the rawness a lot of a lot of those experiences to life to the person who experienced them, mm-hmm. even sometimes before we had physically met, much less become friends, mm-hmm. um, to be like, okay, I can do this, but I, I still, I need to do this. Um, when March book three was done and printed, um, like, you know, th- things got intense, and, and, and emotional throughout on, on all ends of our creative spectrum. But when the congressman called me uh, after the copies of book three came in and you know, he was telling me he was, he was proud of my work and our work together and capturing things, but it was the waver in his voice as he was just telling me that. It was like what was in that waver behind it, like it, it, it a lot of the, like, you know, the power, uh, but also like the, 
you know, some of the brutality and the intensity of his memories being literally brought to life. And this is the person who, like, I, I really, I've seen him time travel in his mind. Like, he has a really, tran he has a really like, multi-dimensional way of experiencing the present and the past, I think. Um, and so, like, when he was telling me this with, like, this shake in his voice, uh, like, when he tells me I've done a good job about that, he means it in this kind of, like, time traveling, trans-dimensional, like, you brought this back to life mm -hmm. for me. Uh, and it's, it's the kind of thing that at times it was always like a crapshoot for me, like, like how am I even like equipped with the skills to potentially do this? Well, would I have to would he try. give you like specific notes like I was not wearing that shirt on that day? Yeah. Or uh, if, if needed, yes. Uh -huh. And like he does actually have a very crystalline memory about a lot uh -huh. of things. And that was very helpful. It was also helpful to be able to fall back on the increased documentation mm -hmm. of the era so that, like, there were a lot of things like that often I didn't have to worry about. But then, yeah, like, the, the more we'd hang out and the more small talk we'd get into, that's when you'd be able to pick on, up on, on other details that I think, as, as, as personal cartoonists, stuff like that, details we're really interested in. But coming from the outside, like you have to fish for some of those details. <laughs> uh, so it was really a long process of circling back around and trying to get all those extra details back into his, his account of events. Yeah. Um, we have some time for questions. If anybody has questions, we do ask that you use the mic. Anybody got a question here, though? All right, well, while you think of, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> oh. Or someone could repeat the question if, yeah. if people are too shy. Yeah, to if walk anybody's over too shy, it. you can just hold up your hand. We're not going to grade you. So, all right, well, or you don't. You don't. Um, yeah, all right. Do you feel that it's easier? Excuse me. Can I trouble you to use the microphone? Oh, right, sorry. Oh. Thank you. Right. Oh, a man in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay. There we go. Uh, as you do autobio works, do you feel like it's easier or harder to do ones based off of things that happened uh, like longer ago than doing something? that happened more recently? Mm. Like, say, if you're doing something related to your childhood or whatever, compared to doing something related to something that happened a few months ago? That's a great question. Um, personally, I've found that waiting a little bit can help because I get really overwhelmed with detail. Um, especially if it's something big and important, you know, like I'm thinking like I need to include this, I remember how the room was laid out, I need to include um, all of these small details. Um, but the way that memory works and degrades um, is that over time you remember like a much more streamlined version of events and it sort of naturally helps you edit because you're like here is what has stuck with me. Like here, here are the things that are most important. Um, I try and take notes, and like those help. But like I, I really am finding like the longer I wait, um, and like longer meaning like even a couple of years or whatever, the longer I wait before like trying to tackle something, the easier time I have turning it into a proper narrative as opposed to like a list of things that happened. Mm -hmm. I. Uh of, of my friend group, uh, which I guess is important to clarify, like my core friend group when I was 12 to 14 is still my core friend group. Uh, I'm basically the, I'm the designated archivist for us and I'm the person <laughs> who things. They're, they ring me up and they're like, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah. And I'm also the person who, uh, you know, I'm the person who takes all the pictures mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and, and that's of significance because, yeah, at a certain point, especially with streamlining and degradation, mm -hmm. uh, there is a certain point where I've had to recognize that I'm like, oh, right, what I possess as photographs now has become the structure of our collective right. memory. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, when I was younger, I had a lot more bandwidth. And I, I did enjoy, I think... Um, 
dealing with things when they were fresher. Um, I, now, I think, especially the way that I've lost so much bandwidth as a parent, uh, finally, like, I've actually forgotten things. Like, I used to be able to list, like, all whatever 500 shows I ever played. And I, uh, but like, I just, I just don't know shit anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of that is like, space had to be cleared up, right. but it's such a relief. Yeah, you I, can. I enjoy the, the aspect to which my memory has degraded just enough. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, it, but I guess by that token, it's, it's kind of freed me up to go further back uh, to, I don't know, like, I, I guess I'm less interested in reckoning with my very young life, um, and I'm more interested in thinking about things that are recent. But it's allowed me to approach it with a little more, a little more clarity and interest. I think, after forgetting some of the stuff from my adolescence and young adulthood, thanks to memory loss caused by parenthood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Out there, anybody else got a question? Yeah. Um, this is a question for Nate. You said you really liked um, like punk and music. I'm curious what music inspired you. I mean, uh, a, a lot of things across the board, but I mean, uh, like nowadays, um, I, I get uh, the things that inspire me the most are like uh, there. There are things within the punk realm that that still do, but like I get most moved now by like Yes, Close to the Edge, and Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, by Black Sabbath. <laughs> And the OJs, Backstabbers, and Brian Eno, uh, but but some of the things that are the most important and central to my life are uh, um, uh, a band from San Francisco called Fuel in the early '90s, and a band from Maryland, like an alien transmission, and seemed to be speaking from my soul, and sort of informed a lot of the way that I write comics and the ways that I lay out prose whenever I can comes from this band, Moss Icon. Um, so I'd say that was most central to my life. Thank you. Any, anybody else have music that really, you know, inspired you, that you still listen to, or in your work? I listened to Bjork a lot in high school. <laughs> that was like my my weird phase. Uh, <laughs> um, after that, it's just shitty music. So you <laughs> say what? Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't listen. I can't listen to music anymore while I draw. Really? As I've gotten older, I wow. can't. Yeah. Not sad. even like instrumental music? No. It's just wow. distracting. Wow. Yeah, I used to be able to, and it's a bummer. It's a bummer. <laughs> you know, bummer to lose it. it makes wow. it a lot more yeah. boring. Another part of growing older. <laughs> <laughs> you just told the records to get off your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> All of music. Yeah. No, I wish I could, you know, just something in my brain now or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have any specific music recommendations or anything. I listened to terrible music when I was younger, and now I listen to good music, but Yay. <laughs> that's all you need to know. <laughs> well, uh, we're just about out of time, so uh, quickly tell, uh, yeah, we're just about out of time, so tell quickly where you are at the show and uh, what your next project is. I'm at table N1 slash N2 um, next to Julia K. Um, right when you walk in the front. Um, my next project um, is for Kella. I'm doing a zine with Lyle Partridge called Dead Parent Society, which is going to be rough. And I'm doing a book for Youth in Decline called I Want to Be Evil, which should hopefully debut in about a year. It's hard to say. It'll debut whenever, sometime. Um, I'm at the Fantagraphics table. It's I think it's right in the right, the far right when you get in. Um, I don't. You know, I had. I made a book about a Quakers during the Civil War. I I don't know when I I finished it. I don't know if if it's good or not. So I'm sitting on it. Um, and I'm making a second animated movie called Crypto Zoo. Mm -hmm. Um, that I hope will be out in 2020. Um, I'm at table uh, J4A with uh, my best friends uh, Yasmin Omar Ada, uh, Rennie Stolberger, and Pablo A. Castro. 
Uh, they have really cool stuff, so definitely check it out. Um, and I'm currently signing a contract with um, Scholastic. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's going to be a semi-autobiographical comic uh, or graphic novel uh, about a tomboy, like coming of age story of a tomboy it's set place in Central America, um, Honduras. Um, so that's going to be really fun. Awesome. And I'm, uh, I'm at the Top Shelf booth, which is W57, right across from uh, Fanagraphics. So right as you enter on the right. And uh, right now I'm inking a collaboration with Van Jensen called Two Dead. Uh, and then my, I'm slowly working on a book called Tornado Children, which is a shorter comics memoir about raising kids in an era of necessary protest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish that could come out tomorrow, but I got to have time to do it. <laughs> Break. Um. Ah, uh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Carta, Dash, Cat, and Nate, and thank you all for coming.